Well, good morning, Pillar Church. My name is Kanan Parker. I'm one of the pastors here at Pillar Church. And as always, it is a joy and an honor to be able to open up God's word with you this morning. I want to make a quick announcement before we continue in our series in the book of Jude. And the announcement is that on October 11th at 10 a.m. at the MLK Center outside, we will be resuming our in-person worship gatherings. Now, notice I said October 11th. That's a Sunday. So we're going from Saturday evening to Sunday mornings. October 11th is the first one. 10 a.m. MLK Center. Bring something to sit on. Bring your Bible. That's the most important item you could bring. Bring your Bible. Bring something to drink. Some water, some coffee. Bring your mask. Bring your mask and wear your mask. We want to provide the safest possible atmosphere for the families and individuals who are coming to worship King Jesus with us. We don't need anybody leaving our midst wondering as to whether or not they've contracted the coronavirus. And so come worship King Jesus with us. Wear your mask, lift your hands, and let's sing praises to our Lord as we hear the word and sing unto his glory. Amen. So we're going to continue in our book of our book of Jude, the book of Jude, in our sermon series called Contending for the Faith. And what I want to do is give you a quick um, overview of where we were leading up to where we are now. Uh, in Jude, Jude is the half brother of Jesus. And in his book, in his letter to the Christians to whom he's writing, he encourages them. He implores them to contend for the faith, Jude 3. And he says, contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Now, why is Jude asking these Christians to contend for the faith? Well, you ask Christians to contend when there is a threat to their faith. And the threat to the faith of the Christians in their day and in ours is that there are false teachers or what I called wolves infiltrating the church. A wolf is somebody who for the sake of self gain does harm to the sheep for the sake of filling their own belly, for the sake of filling their own bank account. They do it all to the detriment and to the harm of the sheep. A, a wolf will teach something that is not true in order that they themselves can come up at your expense. That's what a wolf is. That's what a wolf does. They devour the sheep. They harm the sheep. And the thing with wolves is that it's real. Once you've encountered a wolf in the church, it's really hard to start trusting those who are truly sheep. A wolf taints everything in the church. When there's a wolf in the church, when there are wolves hunting sheep in the church, it gives a false impression of who Jesus is. It gives a false impression of other Christians. And now being open and transparent is hard because you've been hurt by a wolf. And now you do what they do. You keep people at an arm's length from you. You don't want anybody getting too close, not because you're a hypocrite and you're really a wolf under in sheep's clothing, not because of that, but because you have let people in and you've been hurt. And so a wolf does major damage in the flock. A flock can't move freely if there are wolves surrounding them. If there are wolves in that corner, the flock can't flourish going in this direction because there is a, an adversary over there hoping to devour them, hoping to devour us. Now, let us not be fooled. In today's 20th, 21st century church, American church, there are plenty of wolves in pulpits and there are plenty of wolves in churches hoping to fill their bellies and fill their bank accounts and fill their egos and fill their pride and fill their pride at the expense of the sheep whom they're supposed to be caring for. And so Jude, knowing that about his day and us knowing that about ours, have to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. I encourage you, if you have not yet listened to the sermons preceding this one in this series, I encourage you to go back to the very first sermon in the book of Jude called the series is called Contending for the Faith. Go back to the very first one and listen all the way through. That will give you just a, a really firm grasp on where we are today in our text. We saw in Jude verse four that it gave us different characteristics of a wolf. I called that sermon the anatomy of a wolf. At least it was the, it was the first one in that mini series within the bigger series called Contending for the Faith. 
It was called The Anatomy of a Wolf. This week's message is part four of those Anatomy of the Wolf series, still in the book of Jude. It says this in Jude 4. It's a lot in there. It says, For some people who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. They are ungodly, turning the grace of our God into sensuality and denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. There's so much in that. I'm not going to unpack it all. But first thing, but the first thing it does is it tells us the tactics of a wolf, that they come in by stealth. That a wolf never identifies themselves as a wolf when they, when they step in the premises. No, they look like, act like, smell like sheep. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They come in by stealth. Second thing is that they are, their character is ungodly. Now, they're not ungodly externally. It's not like you can look at a wolf and pin them. No, that's not the way or the method in which they're ungodly. They're ungodly in such a way that you can't tell until you fall victim to them as prey. You, it's hard to tell that somebody is ungodly until they've tried to be ungodly with you. It's just really hard to tell. These individuals are characterized as being ungodly in that way. Then it speaks about the teachings of a wolf. And it says about these teachings that they turn the grace of God into sensuality. These wolves, as we'll explore a little bit later, just a little bit, and we explored in that particular ser sermon, these wolves were having sensual interactions with individuals within the church. And it's not like they fell into sin, they tripped into sin, that they found themselves in a hairy situation and they fell to their temptation. No, it's that they decided that they were going to play fast and loose with the grace of God and intentionally sin in a repetitive manner, in a sensual manner, and then claim the blood of Christ to cleanse them. My friends, that's an unrepentant methodology. My friends, that's not somebody who's broken over their sin. That's somebody who I question has ever truly received the grace of God. Because once you've received the grace of God, you are now in awe of his, forgiven, of his forgiveness and his grace towards you. You don't want to sin anymore. You've forgiven me for the sin I've already committed. Your desire is to honor God's grace and to honor his character to honor his name by abstaining from sin. But these individuals sin over and over and over again with no regard, no, no desire, no care to bring honor to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they play fast and loose with the grace of God. That's what we saw in verse four. All of these realities in verse four were bracketed with this reality that they denied the Lord Jesus. And we see the same thing in the anatomy of a wolf part two, where we looked at verses eight and nine, where it says that these individuals rely on their dreams over against the scriptures, right? It's, they, they, they take more stock in what their mind cooked up and what dream they had over against what God's word has said. And, and, and we need to be very careful when, when we allow our dreams to supersede the text. We want dreams from God. We want God to speak for, to us in a supernatural way even. But anything we hear has to be corroborated by the text. And I went through and showed you that God, can, over, throughout the course of history, corroborates his messages and his dreams to his prophets. It also says that they rejected authority. And it says that they were slanderers of angelic ones. They were speaking the language of Satan, which is slander. And in all of these are also bracketed with the reality that they're denying the Lord Jesus. And then in the Anatomy of a Wolf, part three, Pastor Eric preached verses 10 through 11. And he said that they, these individuals claim to be spiritual. They claim to have a spiritual knowledge, yet they know nothing of the true spiritual world. You know those individuals. Individuals who seem to be so godly, but once you get in close, you see that their godliness is a little mushy. It's a little funny. It's a little suspect. It's almost as if they're leading you to something other than Jesus. We're going to touch on that a little bit today. 
It says that their sinful instincts lead them to further sin. And that is also bracketed with the reality that in and through these characteristics, they are also denying the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you may wonder, why are their instincts sinful? How are these individuals' instincts sinful? Well, it's no, no, no shocker that they're sinful. We are fallen by nature. Look at Romans chapter 3. It says, there is no one righteous, not even one. This informs why their instincts are sinful. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks after God. Do you see this? This is speaking about a person's mind, their heart, their will. Everything is being, everything is being encased in the reality of the fall. Every facet of the human being has been impacted by sin and by the fall. It says that there is no one righteous, not even one. That's their status. There is no one who understands. That's their mind. There is no one who seeks God. That's their will. All have fallen. All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does good. That's their works. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They deceive with their tongues and their speech. Venom, a uh, viper's venom is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and wretchedness are in their past. In the past of peace, they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now wonder their instincts are sinful and they lead to further sin. All of our instincts are sinful and lead to further sin. Lest they have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Lest, they are, lest our actions are done to glorify the Son of God and God the Son. Lest our desire is to bring honor and glory through worship of our Lord and King. If that is not our aim, if that is not our motive, if that is not what we are shooting for, then we are out for a self-glorification that we do not deserve, thereby stealing God's glory from Him and trying to ascribe it to ourselves. But the armor of the King doesn't fit us. And all of these things lead to judgment. From verse 4 to verse 11, it says that in, in this way, through these individuals denying the Lord Jesus in the ways that they have, it leads to judgment. How do I know that? It says so in verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 7, verse 10, and verse 11. And now we find ourselves in verse 12 and 13 of the book of Jude where Jude gives us six examples of what a wolf and the dangers of a wolf look like. This is the anatomy of a wolf, part four. He says this in Jude chapter, well, there's only one chapter, Jude 1, verse 12 and 13. This is what the word of God says. It says, these people are dangerous reeves at your love feast, as they eat with you without reverence. They are shepherds who only look after themselves, they are waterless clouds carried along by winds, trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead and uprooted. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shameful deeds, wandering stars from whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. If we were to look at these verses and read through the book of Jude, we would find ourselves a little bit confused as to what Jude is saying here. Jude gives us six examples of what the dangers of a wolf would look like. He says, or he leads us to see that a wolf is unsuspecting, that a wolf is selfish, that a wolf will overpromise but underdeliver, that a wolf will leave you empty and hungry, that a wolf will pollute your holiness, and that a wolf will lead you away from Jesus and closer to themselves. That's what verse 12 and 13 tell us in the book of Jude. Let's look at the first of those six things. And we're just going to breeze these things. The first thing is that a wolf is unsuspecting. Jude 12. He says, these people, these wolves, they're dangerous reeves at your love feast as they eat with you without reverence. Here Jude gives us two examples that he wants us to marry into one so that we have a full orbed understanding of how a wolf is unsuspecting. First, he says that these wolves are dangerous reefs. What's a reef? A reef is an underwater coral rock system, right? A reef is hard and it's sharp. 
reefs are known if they're big enough to be able to rip the bottoms or rip holes into the bottom of the hull of a ship. Okay, that's how hard and how strong a reef can be. If you've ever gone swimming in an ocean or a tropical area and if you and you kick your foot and hit a reef, bro, you will cry for days. They are so hard and some reefs are so sharp, you will surely gash your foot. Now, what's the reality of a reef? Reefs are underwater and you don't know that you hit a reef until it's too late, right? They're unsuspecting in that underwater, you can't see it. And you don't know that you've run into one until it's already gashed a hole in you. Jude is saying these dudes are dangerous reefs. They're unsuspecting underwater and it's almost too late by the time you recognize that one is there. But notice the location of these individuals or the location of these dangerous reefs. Where are they? They're at your love feasts. What's a love feast? A love feast is like an old school church potluck. And in the text, we see evidence that the Christians, that Christians on the day of communion would gather for a big corporate meal. And that when they would gather for a big corporate meal, they would eat. And now a meal signifies something. And, and we understand this even in today's day and age with Corona going around. We understand the importance of a meal. When you invite somebody into your home. You are showing them that you trust them. You are showing them love, right? Like that is an intimate act to invite somebody to your house. Man, why don't you come over and have a meal with my family? I am bringing you into the most vulnerable area of my life, my house and my family. But that's where these false brothers are. They're, they're, they're at the love feast. And at the love feast, when we're sharing a meal, it is a time of, of, of vulnerability. It's a time when people's defenses are down. A meal is my opportunity to serve you. And in my desire to serve you, you are plotting my demise. That's what a wolf does. A wolf will eat and commune with you all while, pl all while plotting your demise. A wolf wants you to be vulnerable with them, that they might be intimate with you. And we see that because they turn the grace of God into what? Sensuality. Right? So they want to get in your home. And then they want to be vulnerable. They want you to, to open up to them. Be vulnerable with them right away so that they can be intimate with you. Now we got to be careful. Not everybody who is trying to get you to open up is trying to be intimate with you. We got to be careful and not be tagging everybody as a wolf. That's just a tactic that a wolf can and does use. A wolf is dangerous because you generally don't see them. A wolf is irreverent because they plot your demise in your own home. That's what the text says, right? It says these people, Jude 12, these people are dangerous reeves at your love feast and they eat without what? Reverence. What could, that is the most irreverent thing in the world to eat in my house and plot my demise while you chew my food. Wow. To sit next to me in close proximity with me. As you plot my demise. A wolf will avoid being fully known. And keep all the attention on you. But praise God that Jesus is the antithesis of a wolf. You see a wolf doesn't want to be fully known. But Jesus came to make God fully known. Jesus came to make the unknowable known. He is the exact imprint of God's nature. Colossians 1.15 says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Jesus didn't allow God to be unsuspecting. No, God incarnated into mankind so that we could come to know God in an intimate way. Not that he may take advantage of us. No, that he may save and redeem us. You see, a wolf is unsuspecting, but in Jesus, we have full disclosure of who God is. Jesus is the antithesis of a wolf. A wolf is unsuspecting, unsuspecting, but Jesus is the full disclosure. The second illustration that Jude gives us is that a wolf is selfish, Jude 12. It says they are shepherds who only look after themselves. Have you ever been up late at night? 
and you're flipping through the channels. I used to do this, and you and you you stumble across TBN, and on TBN Trinity Broadcast Network, you find a whole lot of people teaching a whole lot of things. They're trying to sell you angel feathers. They're trying to sell you holy water, healing cloths. They're telling you to sow a seed right now so you can receive your blessings. Don't you fall for the tales of a wolf. They ain't selling you angel feathers. That's pigeons and seagull feathers, man. That ain't holy water. That's just water. A healing cloth. God gives healing. James 5 tells us how a man or a woman is healed. Read that. Do that. Look what it says about these wolves in Titus verse, chapter 1, verse 10 through 11. It says that these wolves, they are rebellious people, full of empty talk and deception. Hmm. Rebellious people, full of empty talk and deception. Verse 11. It is necessary to silence them. Paul, writing to Titus, is saying the same thing that Jude, writing to his Christians, is saying to them, contend for the faith. These, these dudes need to be silenced. They're saying the same thing. It says they're ruining entire households by teaching what they shouldn't in order to get money dishonestly. That's why they're telling you to sow a seed and receive your blessing. You see, one tactic that the enemy likes to use or wolf likes to use is to add just a little bit of falseness into the truth. You see, if you mix it up together, it's hard to discern what's true and what's false. And because it's a solution, it's a mixture, it's not easy to separate them. And so wolves are specialists at taking a little bit of something that's possibly true for the text, adding in a little bit of something so that they can gain off of your, off of your back and they're feeding it to you. But Paul says that they are dishonest individuals. They, they're rebellious people who need to be silenced. They're teaching what they should not in order to get money dishonestly. If you ever turn on those channels, don't you buy any of those those angel feathers or that holy water or that healing cloth. You pray to the Lord Almighty in heaven. You worship him and petition him. There is one God and one mediator between man and God. And it's not these TBN preachers. It's not this healing cloth or these, these angel feathers. It's not this holy water. It's the man Christ Jesus who is the mediator between you and God. There is no earthly priest that you must go through in order to commune with God. You have direct access to the Lord Almighty because Jesus tore the veil and gave us access. And he calls us a, a priesthood, a royal priesthood. We can go right to him. Save your money. Don't give it to a wolf. Look what Ezekiel 34 says in your cross-reference sheet. By the way, the link is in the description. Look at your cross-reference sheet. All my, cross, all my references are in there. I might say one or two that's not. Sorry. Ezekiel 34, verses 2 through 5. Listen to this. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. <laughs> Shouldn't the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat, wear the wool, Butcher the fatted animals, but you don't tend the flock. You have not strengthened the weak, healed the sick, bandaged the injured, brought back the strays, or sought the lost. Instead, you have ruled them with violence and cruelty. Oh. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. They became food for all the wild animals when they were scattered. A wolf, we all, a wolf will always be looking for a way to come up at your expense. But a shepherd will be looking for ways to bless, serve, and lead you to God's best for you. And praise God, we have a good shepherd. John chapter 10. His name is Christ Jesus. Praise God, we have Jesus as our shepherd Look what Mark 10, 45 says about our shepherd and look at it in contrast to these false shepherds, these false wolves. 
Jesus, who did not come to be served, but to serve and to give, not take, to give his life as a ransom for many. But a wolf has come to be served, not to serve, and to take from your life in order to benefit his. A wolf is selfish. But Jesus, who is the antithesis of a wolf, is selfless. Let's look at the third illustration that Jude gives us. Jude 12. A wolf will, under, will over promise and under deliver. It says they are waterless clouds carried along by winds. Now, we were supposed to preach this sermon outside and I was going to point to the clouds, point to the skies. But this is going to feel the same anyway. Have you ever been duped by the weather? Have you ever thought it was fitting to rain or it wasn't going to rain and then it did rain or it didn't rain? You ever been duped by the weatherman? Now, I got to admit, here in, 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 in Texas, in Fort Worth, I'd be wondering what these weather people be talking about. Because they say something's going to happen. I go outside and that thing don't never happen. I got all kinds of umbrellas and raincoats and I'm out there and the sun is just shining. Or they say it's going to be a beautiful day and I'm, I'm soaking wet outside, wondering what's going on. I don't know. It's just, it's a thing. I've been duped by the weather. But when you see thick clouds come overhead, what does that indicate? It indicates rain. It promises rain. It's the promise of water to fill our basins to drink, right? But Jesus, uh, but like Jesus' last point, a wolf will promise you something just like a cloud. A, 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 a dense cloud coming overhead, a, a wolf will promise one thing but not deliver on that thing. See, a wolf will promise healing. A wolf will promise fulfillment. A wolf will promise joy. A wolf will promise wealth. He'll promise health. He'll promise a bright future. These are big things. These are all weighty things. These are like categories of the soul type things. A wolf will promise all of those things, but a wolf cannot deliver any of them. They can promise you all they want, but they cannot deliver. Look at Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 13 through 15. It says, from the least to the greatest of them, everyone is making profit dishonestly. From the prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. Now check out verse 14. So, so Jeremiah 6.13 is just corroborating what we saw earlier from Ezekiel, right? But look what it says in verse 14. Whew. It says, they have treated my people's brokenness, how? Superficially. Huh. They have treated my people's brokenness superficially. How? Claiming peace, peace when there is no peace. They're promising you healing, fulfillment, joy, wealth, health, bright future. Ain't none of that in your future. Maybe some of that is in your future, but they're promising you a bill of goods. They're giving you a check that's been to bounce. That's what a wolf does. Verse 15, were they ashamed then that they acted so detestably? They weren't at all ashamed. They can no longer feel humiliated. Why? Because they have a callous heart, y'all. Therefore, they will fall among the fallen when I punish them. They will, they will collapse, says the Lord. Now, I'm thankful that that verse gives us an indication of the vindication of God for those who have been taken advantage of by a wolf. But I want you to, to, to remember highlighting your Bible, however, however you want to do it. Verse 14. They have treated my people's brokenness, how? Superficially. We're going to touch on that again a little bit later at one of the next points. A wolf will overpromise and underdeliver. What they tell you doesn't have the fidelity to deliver what they promise it would. But praise God, we have a Savior who delivers on his promises. And the proof of the power of the promises of God is found in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
right? Everything we, te- we need to know about Jesus and what he promised us, that he promised to give his life as a ransom for the redemption of my soul, we know that he accomplished eternal redemption. We're going to see that verse in a minute. But look at Proverbs 25, verse 14. It says, the one who boasts about a gift that does not exist is like clouds and wind without rain. And that's the perfect description of a wolf. A wolf will overpromise and underdeliver, but Jesus always delivers. Let's look at the fourth thing. A wolf will leave you empty and hungry. Jude verse 12 again. It says there are trees in late autumn, fruitless, twice dead and uprooted. You ever have a real long day at work? Real long day. But in the back of your mind, you can't wait to get home because there's that piece of pie waiting for you in the refrigerator that you're fitting to get. It's that piece of cake you've been craving ever since you stepped foot in the office. It's that that Chinese food that you had last night that you can't wait to sink your teeth into again when you get home. Have you ever had that experience where your mouth, you fixing your mouth all day for that treat, for that food, for that whatever it is, right? But then you come home and your wife done ate the food. Your husband done ate the pie. Your kids put their fingers in the cake and ate up all the cake. You ever had that? Were you fixing your mouth all day, craving something all day, but you come home and you're left what? You're left empty, hungry, angry. You see, autumn was the last time for it was the last season for somebody to come and, and take harvest from their fruit trees. And to walk up on a tree, hoping to find fruit and yet finding nothing leaves you in that same predicament of feeling empty, unsatisfied and angry. And in the same way, these false teachers have, were like fruitless trees. Their words of comfort and joy never satisfy. They never satisfy. What they tell you to do never works. Or it seems that it's working until a challenge comes, until another issue comes, and then it crumbles by the wayside. It's because the words of a false prophet, the words of a wolf, lack the power to penetrate to the depths of the soul. Their advice leads to death by starvation. The advice of a wolf leads to death by starvation because they tell you things like more discipline, more accountability, try harder, work harder, pray longer, right? They're telling you all of these things, but what you really need to hear is what I've said several times is you need dependent proximity to Jesus. See, what we're doing is we're feeding people forks and spoons instead of feeding them a meal, You see, a fork and spoon is used to help aid you in the eating process. That's what your discipline does. That's what your work ethic does. It aids you in the meal, but the meal is Jesus. You see, we need dependent proximity on Jesus. It needs to be dependent. Once we recognize that we are broken and in need of help, we will thus be dependent. Once we recognize and have the faith of a child, we will inevitably respond with dependence. Now that we're dependent, we need proximity. We need to be close to Jesus because as we're close to Jesus, our desire to sin dissipates. Not as we try harder, not as you get more accountability partners, not as you try to discipline yourself more or get technology put on your devices. All of that is good and it's helpful, but the reality is you need to be closer proximity to Jesus. You need more Jesus. We can't give our people forks and spoons as their meal and hope that they will sustain them. They are built to assist them in the eating of the meal. But praise God, we have a savior who satisfies our hunger, the hunger of our souls. It's not the advice of a wolf. It's the reality of Jesus. Where do I get that? John chapter six. What did Jesus say in verse 35? I am the bread of life. 
No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. We need to sink the teeth of our souls into Jesus. We need to get on our knees and plead with God to be with us in close proximity to us. We need to labor and in, in, in enjoying Jesus. We need to read the text and behold the person of Jesus. We need to confess our sin and our dependence on Jesus. We need dependent proximity to Jesus, not the tips and tricks of a wolf. Is it what good, well-meaning sheep do? Is we pass on that advice unwittingly. Man, you just got to try harder. Man, you just need more accountability. Man, you just need more discipline. Nah, dog, you need dependent proximity to Jesus. You need to recognize that you need. Then you need to recognize that Jesus provides. Then you need to get close to him. A wolf will leave you empty and hungry, but the person of Jesus, who is the antithesis of a wolf, fills you up and you will never be hungry or thirsty again. The fifth illustration that Jude gives us is that a wolf will pollute your holiness. Jude 13. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shameful deeds. When I was a, a pastor in New York for five years, I had the pleasure, uh, three of those five years, to take uh, seniors from the church's high school on a trip with some other individuals down to Virginia Beach. And man, we used to have a ball. And I remember the first time we drove those seniors down to Virginia Beach for their senior trip. Man, we got out there on the beach. Boy, the sand was crystal. The water was was warm. It was I mean, the seagulls flying like it was like it was like a, a magazine cover. It was gorgeous. But I remember then the second year I brought the seniors down and it was just a few weeks off in terms of the time of the year. But man, we drove down, we got to the beach and there was this nasty, white, smelly foam. If you've ever been near, you know, the wa waterfront and, and you may know, you may have seen this. It's this nasty dirty white foam that just coming up from the sea and it stinks and it's just disgusting and it ruins all the beauty of the beach like you don't even want to walk on the beach because the stench is so bad you find yourself going all the way back to like the boardwalk or or the concrete uh, sidewalk that's further from the sand because the stench of the ocean is just so bad it's horrible Jude is 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 likening these false wolves these false teachers He's likening their actions to that nasty foam, right? He says they're wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shameful deeds. That's the reality that Jude is speaking to. A wolf will manipulate you in such a way so that you feel comfortable with the nasty, shameful deeds. You see, a wolf will, will cause you to run into the foam, to enjoy the, the, the stank of that beach, so to speak. Let me give you a text to help illuminate. And I said I would get to a text like this earlier in the message. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 5 through 6. It, it, this is how uh, Paul describes these wolves. He says, they are holding to a form of godliness, but denying its power. Then Paul tells us to avoid these people. For among them are those who, what do they do? They worm their way into households and deceive gullible women overwhelmed by sins. They... They wiggle their way into somebody's house and they deceive them. That doesn't mean they overpower them. It means they convince them. Just like the, the serpent deceived and convinced Eve, right? These wolves deceive these women, overwhelmed by sins, and they're led astray by various passions. Instead of leading these women to holiness, instead of leading them to a beach that is clean, uh, free of the, the nasty, stinky foam, they're trying to sleep with other individuals in the church under the guides of care and counsel and comfort. To praise God, we have a Savior who instead of taking advantage of you in your mess, gives you his life, uh, gives you his life to truly love you in the midst of your mess. Ooh, I wrote it and I read it and I was like, ooh, that's good as I was reading it. 
we have a savior who instead of taking advantage of you in your mess, gives you his life to truly love you and care for you in the midst of your mess. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 through 25. It says, now may the God of peace himself do what? Sanctify you. How much? Completely, it says. Yo, the word of God is so cool. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you excuse me, completely. And may your what? Your whole spirit, soul, and body be what? Be kept sound and blameless. What does the Lord want to do? He wants to make you whole and holy. All of you, your, your, your spirit, your soul, your body. He wants you to be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And how can we have comfort in this? Verse 24, he who calls you is faithful. He will do it. See, a wolf will pollute your holiness, but Jesus desires to sanctify that beach and to sanctify your holiness. Number six, a wolf is aimless, leading people astray. Verse 13 of Jude tells us this. It says, these wolves are wandering stars for whom the blackness of darkness is reserved forever. There's a science called astro-navigation. Astro-navigation is when you're traveling a long distance and you're doing so and you're being guided by celestial beings, right? Stars and planets. They are your direction compasses, right? You got north, south, east, west, but the star will dictate and determine how far and what direction you need to go. However, astro navigation only works if that star or that planet is stationary, not wandering, not moving. It's regular, right? It stays in the same locale at the same time as the planet turns every night at this particular time, that star will be aligned right there. And that's given the rotational system of the solar system. So as the planets move, the stars change in position and all this kind of stuff, it's a dope science. Look into it, astro navigation. Now, if you try to do astro navigation with a star that's wandering or a star that's moving or a shooting star, if, it may, if the text may be referring to that, you find yourself going in a direction that is wrong. You see, a sh and, 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 and Jude is comparing these shooting stars, these wandering stars to these false prophets, these wolves. You see, a shooting star gets you chasing the star, but going far from the destination that God would have you. You see, you get so infatuated with the flashy provocativeness of the star. It tells you, come this way, follow me, but it's missing the second part of that famous phrase. It's follow me as I follow Christ. You see, a, a good navigational unit, right? A good shepherd, a good under shepherd is going to point you in a particular direction, showing you that is the destination. I'm going this way toward that destination. But a shooting star is going to lead you into darkness and into blackness. And that's exactly what the text tells you. It's going to be leading you to itself rather than leading you to Jesus. And anything or anyone that leads you to itself that's not trying to constantly point you to Jesus is leading you astray. And that's what these false wolves do. These false prophets do. But praise God, we have a savior who told us that he is the way. John 14, 6. He said that he is the way. Why? Because he is the truth and he is the life. And we can follow Jesus all the way to the promised land. You see, a wolf is aimless, leading people astray. But Jesus leads us all the way home. Now, don't get lost in this message, looking around to figure out who amongst us is a wolf. Why? Because I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Every message in the back of your mind, you should be considering firstly yourself, as I have to firstly consider myself. Am I being described in this passage? You need to ask yourself, do I avoid being fully known? You need to ask yourself, do I break bread with other individuals because I have an ulterior motive? 
You need to ask yourself, do I only come here to pillar church to satisfy my own sinful desires and cravings? You need to ask yourself, do, do I have plans to take advantage of individuals within the, the local church context? You need to ask yourself, did I come here to gain a following? Because after all, we're a small church and small churches are easily influenced, right? They're also easily defended. As you, de as you evaluate yourself, know that these actions lead you to denial of the Lord Jesus. Just like Jude 4 did, just like the rest of uh, those passages I explained in the beginning of the, of the sermon do. They all lead you away from Jesus. But praise God, we have a Savior who instead of being hidden in stealth, makes God known. We have a Savior who instead of being focused on self-gain, came to serve rather than to be served. We have a Savior who instead of over-promising and under-delivering, has actually obtained eternal redemption. We have a Savior who instead of leaving us empty and hungry, satisfies the hunger of our souls. We have a Savior who instead of leaving a wake of destruction and stank, makes us whole and pure before God. We have a Savior who instead of leading us astray, takes us by the hand and leads us unto eternal life. Pillar Church, we are called to contend for the faith. We are called to contend for the reality of the person of Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. That we have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scriptures alone, to the glory of God alone. Pillar Church, place your faith in Jesus. Father God, thank you for this particular passage. Though we would be tempted to read over it quickly, I pray that our quick summary of these six examples that Jude gives us would further clarify some of the realities of the anatomy of a wolf. Father, give us eyes to see as a church. Give us ears to hear. Give the under shepherds unction, wisdom, tenderness to serve and to love. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the antithesis of a wolf. Fill us with your Holy Spirit as we go from here in Jesus' name.